Okay. All right, so this formula is for something called water potential. And water potential is basically a number that measures which direction water is going to go. That's all it is. And it's represented by the Greek letter psi, which people just say, oh, it's that pitchfork formula. But it's, uh, it's basically water potential. All right. So I don't know if you remember, but we actually talked a little bit about this last week. I drew a YouTube like this. It was a little better than this one. but And I drew a bunch of solute on this side and only a little bit on this side. And I asked you which direction would stuff go. Would water go towards side A or towards side B? B, right? Because B is the hypertonic side. And I told you that what you would actually see happen over time is that the water level on side B would actually go up and the water level on side A would go down. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. But then I said, if you left this, you wouldn't start seeing water start spewing out of the top of side B. Why? Gravity. Gravity. Because of gravity. And so this formula is taking in, into account the factor of pressure. In other words, this is saying that the direction that, direction that water is going to go is not just based on the solute, which is our hypertonic, hypotonic thing, but it's also based on pressure. So we know that water is going to be attracted to the side with higher solute. And this is down here. So water is going to be attracted to the side with higher solute. But at the same time, higher pressure is going to prevent water from entering. So in other words, if we have, for example, a plant cell, remember how we said an animal cell would just swell, 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 and explode? Because we don't take account pressure potential into account because the pressure of the cell membrane is not really enough to hold everything together, so it just swells up until it bursts. But with plants, we now have a cell wall, which means it'll swell up to a certain point, but it'll actually reach a water potential of equilibrium. In other words, water potential will be equal to zero. Water will be going both directions at the same rate, not necessarily because it's isotonic, but because pressure is preventing any more water from going to that side without some leaving. Let me show you a picture on the next slide. And again, I'll post this. So if you're trying to scramble and write it down, it'll be there. All right, you can see it better on the TV. So take a look at this picture. So we're saying that the if we just look at solute, they're saying that the solute potential, which happens to be always a negative number, is negative 0.23, meaning water's being pulled towards this side, which you would guess from the drawing anyway, because there's all those dots there, water's going to tend to go to that side. But they put a little piston here, and they created pressure so that the water level can't go up. And they're telling you that the pressure is plus 0.23. Well, that means that the water potential is actually going to be zero, meaning the water is going to be going both directions at the same rate. Why? Because since this can't go up any further, every time a water goes this way, it's going to force the water the other way. So this whole formula is basically just taking into account pressure. It's saying that, yes, solute attracts water. Water will tend to go towards a hypertonic side. But if we take pressure into account, water may not continue to go to that side, like I said, until it starts spewing over the top. That pressure will play a role, and it will reach um, water potential equilibrium. But that doesn't mean that it's isotonic, necessarily. Isotonic only has to do with solute. Does that make sense, kind of, sort of? Well, let's apply it. So here is, um, and I used pi here. I'm going to change it to p. Before I upload it, I'll fix it to pee. All right, so we have a YouTube here. And I'll remind you that water potential, water is always going to go towards the more negative water potential. Water will always go towards the more negative water potential. So if you're given this, our solute potential on the left is negative 4. And our solute potential on the right is negative 2, which basically means that the left side is hypertonic compared to the right side. If solute was the only thing playing a role, which way would the water go? Left. To the right. Left. To the left, towards the more negative solute potential. So that may still be the case, but in order to see if water will still go to the left, we need to take a look at the pressure. So the way you would do this, really simple, you just plug in the numbers. So the water potential on the left side is going to be 1.5 plus negative 4. 
and my water potential on the right side is going to be 3 plus negative 2. So my water potential on the left is going to be 2.5 negative, yeah? And my water potential on the right is going to be positive 1. If water always goes towards the more negative side, water will go to the left in this situation. Oh, what's 1.5? Like, what is it? 1.5 was the pressure potential. Okay. So that's pressure potential, and then the so one below that is? is solute potential. And solute potential is always either zero if it's pure water or it's negative if there's any solute at all. Because the more solute there is, the more water's going to be pulled towards that side. So think of negative as, you know, sucking water towards it in, in this particular case. So the higher the negative, the more water it's probably has? The more negative it is, actually, the less water it has. So it more, it more wasn't a pull. More of a pull. Okay. More negative, it has more pull of water. Water wants to go towards the side that's negative because that's the side that's like lacking water, if we think of it that way. Okay. All right, so here's another problem. A little bit different. This time, I'm telling you that the pressure, uh, that the, the water potential is zero. So I'm telling you that water's going both directions equally at this point. And I tell you that the solute potential on this side is negative two and the solute potential on the right side is negative six. Now technically, if pressure wasn't playing a role, which way should the water go? Right. To the right. But because of pressure, we know that it's actually equalized. Water's not going to the right. Now, if it's at equilibrium, the way you can solve this is this. We know that if water's going both directions at the same rate, that means that pressure plus solute on the left side must be equal to the combination of pressure and solute on the right side. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, if, if water's going both directions equally, I know the solutes are not equal and the pressures are not equal, but I know the combination of the two, the two sides are equal. So if we plug in our numbers, and again, I'll change these to P's. So if we change this, if we plug in our numbers, we have five plus negative two is equal to the pressure potential that we're solving for plus negative six. So what is the pressure potential on the right side? Good, I know some people are faster with their math. So we'd add six to both sides. And so this pressure potential would be nine on the right. And because of that, water would be going equally in both directions. Even though there's more solute on the right side, the pressure is preventing this water level from going up anymore. And I don't know that the water levels would even be equal to each other, it doesn't matter. The point is there's pressure difference on the two sides. Yes. So when you're looking for um, like pressure potential for one of them, you're, you're saying the equations are equal to each other pretty much. Like Correct. Okay. Correct. The only way you could solve this is you'd have to be told that water potential is zero, in which case now we know the two only sides zero? equal each other. The water potential would have to be zero. Okay. Or you'd have to be told that the water potential is equal. You'd have to be told the water potential is equal or you can't set them equal to each other. So does it matter which like side numbers are on No, but five and two have to be together. Okay. Yeah, you can't mix the five and the six. But yeah, no, it wouldn't matter left or right. I was just making up a side A and a side B. Yes. Yeah. Would the same thing happen if you were missing the water solute? Yes. You could be missing any one of these if you knew all the other ones. Just like in like gas laws problems or any of those. Okay. If you're still with me, hopefully you'll be with me through this very last part. And if you had AP Chem, because I know some of you did, then you should recognize a formula almost like this that was pi is equal to I MRT. I think it was osmotic potential. This is a little different because this is solute potential. In other words, that's why it's negative because you're looking at the opposite, not the, the water, but the solute. But it works the same way. This looks complicated, but it's not. So here's what we're saying. I could give you the, pr the remember, water potential is equal to pressure potential plus the solute potential. This you can actually calculate. Typically, I would give you this, ask you to calculate this, and then ask you to calculate the water potential, which sounds kind of complicated, but like I said, it's not as bad as it sounds. First of all, R is a constant, and it'll be provided for you. And by the way, all the formulas are provided for you. You're given a formula sheet. So you're, you're told this formula, you're told what all the letters stand for. You're given this formula, you're told what all the letters stand for. You're even given how to get the temperature in Kelvin, which is how, do you remember? Add 273. Add 273. Got it. 
<laughs> so you're even provided with that. So it's just a matter of knowing how to use the formula. All the information is given to you. All right, so this is easy. This is going to be easy because they're going to give you the temperature. Worst case scenario, you just have to convert it to Kelvin. Ions are easy if you remember a little basic chemistry. And if you don't, I'm going to remind you of it now. If it's covalent, you're going to say, oh, crap, how am I going to know if it's covalent? If it's covalent, you're going to be given a word. You're going to be given that the solute is glucose, the solute is starch, the solute is protein. If you're given a word, you're going to assume it's covalent. For all covalent compounds, I equals 1 because it doesn't break up. You, you put sugar in water, you get individual sugar molecules in water. If you're given a formula, remember a metal and a nonmetal, and it's ionic, then I is the number of ions it breaks into. So for example, if it's NaCl and we put it in water, NaCl breaks into Na and Cl. So I would be 2. Because hmm? it breaks into Na plus and Cl minus. What if it was CaCl2? What would I be? 3. Three. Because it breaks into a Ca and two Cl's. So you just break it up into how many elements are in the formula, and that's I. So if you're given a word, you can assume I is one. If you're given a formula, just figure out how many elements there are, and that's your I. Yes? So the, is the molarity going to be given, us, given to us, or we have to figure out the molarity? And that's the one thing that you have to calculate. And it's actually really easy because you're going to get it from a graph. I don't know if we did that in chem, if you got it from a graph. But that's how we're going to do it. So let me show you how you get it from a graph. So here's a graph. So let's say that I have a bag, and in my bag I have some amount, some molarity, and I put that bag in pure water. Now if that bag's got something in it besides pure water, it's got some solute in it, what should happen when I put that bag in pure water? Water should go into the bag. So this bag should gain weight. So I have my bag, I put it in pure water, and it gains weight. Now, what if I put it in 0.2 molar solution and the bag has some number greater than 0.2? In other words, let's say my bag has 0.3. This is still hypertonic. It's still going to go in. But will as much go in as when it was in pure water? No, right? So let's say at 0.1, this much goes in. And as I get closer and closer to isotonic, the bag's not going to gain as much weight, correct? Now, what if my bag has 0.3 and I put it in 0.7? Now what's going to happen? Water's going to leave. So the more hypertonic it is outside, the more weight this bag is going to lose. So isn't it true that if I graph the amount of weight the bag gains or loses, even if I don't know what the molarity in the bag is, wherever it crosses zero would represent isotonic. And that's C. So you would be either given a graph or asked to make a graph, and all you have to know is wherever it crosses the x-axis, that represents the molarity that you're predicting was in the bag. Because at that molarity, it wouldn't have gained weight or lost weight. It would have been isotonic. C is constant. Is that what it means, constant? Yeah. Okay. So in this particular problem, just to erase these annotations, I don't know how well you can see it, but what would C be in this particular problem? What would have been the tonicity of the, or the uh, molarity in the bag? Yeah, and here's where if you graphed it on a test, I would be very lenient. If you knew to make a line, and your line crossed the x-axis, and you gave me 0 0.4, 0 0.43, 0 0.45, I would be very, very lenient with that. If you gave me 0.8, I'm going to know you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> But obviously, you're going to get dots for where it gained weight, where it lost weight, and wherever it crossed the x-axis, that right there, that's C. So if we go to, let's, let's do this one. So let's take this one. This is a little walkthrough. I think that's at 14. All right, so I have a bag of 0.7. If I put my bag of 0.7, I have three bags of 0.7. 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. In which one of these will my bag of 0.7 gain weight? The 0 and 0.5, right? Because in both of those, my bag is hypertonic, my, dad, my bag would gain weight. What about in 1.0? Now this is hypertonic, my bag would lose weight. If I graph this, here's what I would get. 
All right, so this is to clarify from yesterday. Here's the idea. If I have a bag that contains, I already know that in my bag is 0.7 molar solution, okay? And I put that bag of 0.7 into my, my flask of zero molar solution, basically pure water. What should happen to that bag? Swell up. It says swell up. Agree? Don't get all swollen. It will swell up. Because, remember, the rule, water will always travel towards the hypertonic solution. And this 0.7 is definitely hypertonic to zero. Okay? So if we, right, so if we were to picture our flask that's zero molar, here's our, all our little water molecules. And our bag is 0.7. So here's a bunch of solute that can't pass. And here are our water molecules. Obviously, if only water can pass, there's a much higher chance of a water hitting from the left and going towards the right. Even though water can go the other way, just by random chance, this bag is going to get bigger. What about in the point 0.5? Point 0.5 would kind of naturally absorb the point 0.7, but you're going to have some water. Good. It will swell, but not as much. And let's imagine why that's going to happen, because again, Here's our 0.5. It's got some sugar molecules in it. And our 0.7, though, has more sugar molecules in it. I didn't draw it as nicely. So here's our 0.7, there's our 0.5. We still have a higher chance of water going to the right. But it's not as high of a chance as this first one, so we're probably going to see a little more water go to the left. So this will gain weight, but it shouldn't gain as much weight. How about in the 1.0? Water will leave the bag. Good. In the 1.0, we have the opposite situation. Now, here on this side, we have all this sugar. And on this side, there's more water. And so now the chances are higher for the water to leave the bag. All right, now here's my point. We could graph this. So let's imagine making one of our T graphs that I taught you how to make, because you're gonna have to know how to make on the test. And we got zero, and we've got 0.5, and we've got 1.0. And we said that in zero, this bag will gain probably a lot of weight. In 0.5, it's not gonna gain as much. And in 1.0, it's gonna lose some weight. If we connect this or make a line of best fit, where should it cross the x-axis? If we know what's in the bag is 0.7, what solution should be isotonic to 0 0.7? 0 0.7. So this should cross at 0.7. In other words, it's going to cross the x-axis where it's isotonic. So technically, isn't it true that even if I did not know what was in this bag, I could figure it out if I put some beakers yeah. in different solutions and graphed my results. I got you. And where it crossed the x-axis, that would tell me what was isotonic. Right. So, yes? Well, I didn't put numbers here. The point is, you would actually calculate the percent change in mass oh. and graph those numbers. Which brings us to what I showed, I would have to give that to you. Which brings us to what I showed you yesterday. Maybe that clarifies a little more. So here, that means if this is where this one crossed, so it's hard to see, but this was zero. And if it crossed here, right around 0.4 or 0.42 or 0.43, that must mean that what was in the bag or the potato or whatever it was, was 0.43. And that was how we calculated C because C represented the molarity of what was in the bag, or the potato, or the grape, or whatever it was we were measuring. Yes? Well, just as like a request, if T was temperature, C was in the bag, what was the point or something? something 0.0821, like right? That you gave us. Yep. And then what was the little low case R? And then I was based on the solute. If it was glucose, I would be one. If it's ionic. And that's also given in the And that's given. So you're given everything. The only thing you would be left to calculate would be C. And you would calculate it by either looking at a graph that's provided for you, <coughs> graphing percent changes in mass that are given to you, or in the most difficult kind of problem, you're given the before weight and the after weight, you calculate the percent change in mass, you graph it, 
and then you get C from there. That would require the most work. However, based on what you did last week, you should know how to do all of those things. So C is where it crosses the x-axis, and the point of C, the whole point, is that remembers it's isotonic. Now that brings us to what we're doing in the lab today. So I'm going to give you potatoes. Okay? You're not eating them. Oh, yes. We're not playing Let's Dare Who Will Eat the Potatoes. <laughs> Maybe it's later. It's, it's what are the odds? <laughs> oh, what are the odds? I'm sorry. All right. Hush, I'm going to run out of time on this recording. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you potatoes. I don't know what the molarity of potato cells is, but I do know that it's somewhere between zero and one. So isn't it true that if I put my potatoes in all these different solutions, I would be able to figure out where it crosses the X and therefore the molarity of the potatoes. Okay, but we're gonna take it a, a step further than that. So now it's gonna be even harder than that. Oh no, I know, even harder than that. I'm giving you the solutions, but they're all mixed up. You're not told which one is 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, or 1.0, or, or pure water. All I've done is I've color coded them. So all you're gonna know is there's an orange solution, there's a purple solution, but here's the deal. Based on what you know now, in which solution should the potato gain the most weight? No, no, no. Based on these. Water, right? So whatever color's water, you'll be able to tell, because that'll be the one that gains the most weight. Which one should the potato lose the most weight? 1.0. So whatever color it loses the most weight in, you'll be able to identify that's 1.0. And you should, because you know it's going to do this, you should be able to figure out which is which. That's your first job. And your second job is to figure out the molarity of the potato cells where it ends up crossing the x-axis. Right. Yes. So-so. All right, so listen, wait. Let me tell you what to do.